I mean, the uh, American ANSI salute. And one thing I was grateful to uh, receive from the Montour County Historical Society was they had a handful of these ANSI Saloon League medals. So you see here on the right hand side, uh, on the front, they have the logo saying the saloon must go, American ANSI Saloon League, and on the back, it reads, the object of this league is the suppression of the saloon. So at this time, people used the term, you know, bar, saloon interchangeably. Uh, basically, any establishment that was serving alcohol, they wanted to do away with. Now, the Anti Saloon League was uh, very much influenced by the church. It had very much tied up in Christian values. Uh, and by 1923, over 5,000 churches in Pennsylvania alone had an official affiliation with the Anti Saloon League. So, as temperance and this desire for prohibition gained traction in the United States, eventually, in 1919, the United States ratified the 18th Amendment, which officially prohibited alcohol. And the language of that 18th Amendment is actually a little tricky and required some more legislation. So, word for word, the 18th Amendment banned the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicated liquor. Now the issue with that is what exactly intoxicating liquors were was up for question. People could make the argument that uh, alcohol with lower percentages than hard liquor would not be intoxicating. You could say, you know, beer isn't intoxicating as much as whiskey. So that required further legislation through the form of the Natural Prohibition Act. You may also hear it referred to as the Volstead Act, which was introduced by uh, Congressman Andrew Volstead. He Got this on the books, which was an actual definition for intoxicating liquors, anything with alcohol content of more than half a percent. So just to, if you, if you aren't know, beer is around 4% alcohol mm -hmm. volume. So this would be very, very weak alcohol if they were trying to pass it, you know, 0.6%. It would basically be worthless. So once the Volstead Act is on the books, we pretty much have prohibition in full swing. Now, prohibition is going to be in effect throughout the 1920s, and during that time, the country is going to divide uh, as wets want uh, pro or alcohol back. Uh, that's sort of the label for them. They, they want the alcohol, they're wets, and dries. They want the country to stay dry. They want prohibition to stay in effect. And the country's going to be pretty divided throughout the 20s. Although it's not necessarily going to be on partisan lines. There's going to be Democrats that are wet. There's going to be Democrats that are dry. It's really not going to find a political party to latch on to. Even in the presidential election for the year 1932, uh, the Democratic Party uh, under uh, the FDR uh, presidential ticket, they sort of adopted that anti-prohibition stance. But that wasn't to say that the Republicans were totally you know, against getting rid of uh, prohibition as well. Either way, FDR is elected in that election in 1932. And within a year, uh, the 21st Amendment was passed, which did away with prohibition. So that's sort of a overview of the prohibition timeline. We're going to sort of rewind back to 1915. So in October 23rd, 1915, Saturday, there was this huge temperance parade in Danville, where we got the Anti Saloon League and this Reverend William P. Nicholson from Bloomsburg. Uh, he traveled around a lot. He went down to places like Lancaster. He went over to Milton uh, to try to organize a temperance movement to get the people of Pennsylvania behind a prohibition. So as this parade came together, whenever it was all said and done, whenever it was carried out, it was said to be the largest in Danville up to that point. Uh, almost 4,000 people uh, were marching in the parade, and that's not to count the spectators along Mill Street. Uh, the account from the newspaper said that Mill Street was jammed from end to end with thousands upon thousands of spectators. So a lot of people we're talking about here. And here you see the headline, uh, War on Booze Traffic and Sermon and Song. So part of this whole temperance uh, event was the parade on Saturday, and then the following afternoon, uh, William P. Nicholson, he delivered his sermon basically attacking uh, alcohol. So throughout both of these events, the parade and the sermon itself, you see some specific persuasive techniques to try to win people over uh, to feel like prohibition is the right direction to go. Uh, Christian values are leaned on heavily, as well as patriotism. People uh, having pride in their country, using that feeling 
So maybe bring them over to the side of the prohibition. So one thing I want to point out is the Danville Morning News, who published this article, uh, it's important to recognize they may have had a bias one way or another. So as we see here, here's our headline talking about this parade. Which part of the show? So well, okay. Either way, we have this headline talking about this parade, and right next to this headline talking about this temperance parade, we have an article talking about some 17 and 18 year old boys who had access to alcohol through some local uh, liquor distributors. Um, and also below, we have a story about some drunks wandering the south side of Danville uh, and getting into trouble with the police. So if you had any doubts that this huge parade in Danville was a good thing, uh, here's some reminders about what alcohol is doing to the town. We got kids getting access to it, getting drunk in Memorial Park, and people wandering the streets uh, on Sunday night. <laughs> OK, so moving on to the parade itself. So the Danville band was leading this parade in song, followed by Reverend Nicholson. He's marching, you know, shaking hands, all, all that stuff. Uh, behind him, we have a sort of entourage of supporters, uh, women, children, carrying these banners uh, with these temperance messages. We have banners that read, are you rearing your boy for the saloon? We have hell is full of Christians that sign liquor licenses. We have a saloonless nation by 1920. That was sort of a big motto that you're going to see. But you see, by the grace of God, the saloon won't get us. That was one of these banners that was held by these little children. So matter like 10, 8-year-olds holding this banner. By the grace of God, the saloon won't get us. Uh, every fourth home must supply a boy for the saloon. So think about in the way you may think about like a military draft. How like every fourth home must contribute a son to go fight this war. Every fourth home must supply a boy for the saloon. And then finally, vote the saloon out and save your boy and girl. So a plethora of messages here trying to get people on the side of prohibition. Now, behind these uh, people carrying these banners, you have a lot of women who came out to march in this parade. Women had a huge part to play in the anti-saloon league and the temperance movement. And we have mothers, uh, shopkeepers, uh, mill girls that worked uh, here in Danville with these white ribbons signifying their support uh, for the temperance. As far as other people marching the parade, it wasn't just residents of Danville. You had people traveling, traveling around with Nicholson, people coming from Milton and Bloomsburg to participate in this parade. You'll see later on when we look at that prohibition ballot, Milton was very strongly for prohibition. Even, uh, you could say, stronger than Danville, so we'll see. And of course, American flags are said to be everywhere. So as you saw in that first photograph we looked at, uh, that was from 1909, just to give us an idea about what Danville was looking like at this time. But American flags were strewn up and down Mill Street, uh, being carried by people in the parade. So, you know, tapping into that national pride, trying to get people to feel good that prohibition, that temperance is an American thing that you ought to be interested in. So, after the parade, you ha had these people marching down Mill Street. And after the fact, a crowd of about 2,000 people congregated after this parade on Bloom Street. So after marching down Mill Street, they go on Bloom Street, where you have a brief sermon uh, delivered by Nicholson. He's going to say some words, but his main sermon is going to be the next day on Sunday. As people come together, you have the Daniel Sunshine Choir, which is this children's choir, where they come together and they sing a handful of songs uh, supporting this prohibition message. Uh, here's a photograph from the Montour County Historical Society. This isn't a photograph of the choir from that event, but this is a photograph they had of the Sunshine Choir, just to give you an idea of this is a bunch of little kids singing these uh, Prohibition songs. We're going to take a look at what some of these songs were in a second, but uh, keep in mind as they're singing these songs, about 300 children, as the singers are finishing this last song, a banner was unfurled down from Presumably, they were in the church on Bloom Street. It was an unfurled from the ceiling with an American flag and a banner that read a saloonless nation by 1920, as these children are finishing their final song, which seems like it would be quite a spectacle. <laughs> so here's some examples of some of the songs they were singing. I'll spare you the singing. But um, if you take a look at some of these lyrics, we have uh, 
the Rummies are on the run, uh, presumably to the tune of When Johnny Comes Marching Home. Uh, we have Anti Rummo, Anti Rummo, oh, down, down, down with rum. Rum is a man trap, a terrible death trap. Uh, we have one a little bit more catered to the event. We have Hiss Boo, they would be whistling, I suppose. Tabernacle, Tabernacle, Nicholson, Nicholson, rah, 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 drive the boot shops all the way, voters of Danville, PX. So that one definitely <laughs> especially catered to this event, but you get an idea about what kind of songs they're having with lower kids, these little eight, ten year olds. Go ahead and sink those crowd <laughs> So now we get into the good stuff. So after this whole Palm Circumstances parade uh, and singing on Saturday, Sunday afternoon, uh, presumably, you know, right after church, Nickel City's delivering this sermon uh, back here in Danville. So uh, with the sermon, it's really interesting to see what kinds of things he tries to play on with his audience. Again, Christian values are going to come into play. Also patriotism, people feeling uh, pride in being American and trying to take advantage of that feeling. So to start his sermon, he gives a little bit of an analogy to explain his personal feelings towards alcohol in the United States. So he says, quote, I am not against the saloon keeper, but that it's the saloon man's business that I'm playing. It's like the flea. I have nothing against the flea. I believe the flea is a creation of God and here for a purpose, but I'm against the way that the flea makes his living. So it is with the saloon keeper, but I am against the way he makes a living. Then he continues with another comparison. He says, quote, say, did you ever notice the word bar over a saloon? That's what it is, a bar to heaven, a door to hell. Whoever named it, named it well. So, of course, Nicholson, he's a reverend, he's a pastor, it's a sermon. Of course, he's going to be tapping into his Christian values, but if that is, is his target audience, this would be an apt comparison, comparing it to a creation of God. You don't hate the person who's engaging in this business. You have nothing personal against him, but you hate the business itself. And that's sort of how he uh, prepares his audience to accept the rest of his message, whatever, whatever else he has to say. So after this analogy, he goes into speak to his own personal experience uh, with alcohol. Um, he admits that he has his own past struggles with alcoholism. He says, quote, for seven and a half years I was a drunkard, and I know. Some say, some think I say too hard things about the saloon, that I am too severe, but I have reasons for being hard and severe. I have marks on my body and head left from the times I was kicked out of the hell holes after they had skinned me of all I had. I hate the traffic with all the power and virulence that is in me. The dirty, blood-sucking, stinking child of the devil. I was born in hell, and I'm going to do all that I can to put it back in hell, where it belongs, where I believe it is the most low-down, corrupt, blinding, and hellish thing on earth. So it's not necessarily that he's claiming to be a saint. He admits that he's had his own past struggles with alcoholism, but he's using that as a way to say that he owes something to himself, to God, to try to steer everyone else on the right path. So here's where we really see this whole patriotism <laughs> national identity come into play. Um, at this time of the sermon, again, it's 1915, for those who don't know that, it's right in the middle of the First World War. So while the First World War is going on, the United States isn't necessarily involved yet, but it is something people would be aware of that's going on. So Nicholson, he refers to what's going on abroad here when he says, quote, I think I thank God for a man in Russia who with one stroke made that nation boozeless and put one sixth of the world's population in dry territory. The great European war is doing one good thing. It has brought nations to the realization of the evils of drink. Lloyd George, a member of the British cabinet, said, England has three enemies to fight, Germany, Austria, and liquor. And the most dangerous of the three is liquor. Every country is doing its best to blot out the evil. So here, in a way, he is trying to make the audience who is likely patriotic, they're proud to be Americans, feel a little guilty. Whereas these other nations around the world are doing God's mission to get rid of alcohol, and they're sort of left stuck with this sort of curse in his eyes. Um, not to mention, the man that he is referring to in Russia who did away with alcohol is Tsar Nicholas II. So an absolutist ruler, it's a little strange that he's tapping into that as someone who would be sort of the antithesis of what these people in America would believe in with the democratic government. But it is something that he refers to how other countries around the world are handling alcohol, suggesting that 
America should maybe do the same. So this next part of his sermon, he has some specific charges that he brings against the business of alcohol and the saloon. Uh, he calls them a coward, a murderer, a robber, a thief, and he does that in very specific ways. So I just want to go into just how he goes about doing this. So first, he accuses the saloon of being a coward. He says, quote, the saloon is a coward. Say, man, why is it that the saloon man puts colored glass in his windows and has opaque doors? Are they ashamed of what they are selling? Why is it that the dirty, stinking business is conducted always behind closed doors? Why does it take the stinky clothes? Because it's a coward. The shoe man puts his shoes in a display window. The grocery man puts his groceries where all can see them. He's proud of his product. Say, wouldn't it be a fine sight some Sunday morning as you go to church if all the saloons here would have their windows the finished product of the night before? So that finished product of the night before they're referring to, of course, is all of the empty whiskey bottles, maybe some of the hungover patrons that slept over from the night before. He's saying, well, since we can't see those things when we, you know, try to glance into the bar like we do at the grocery store or at the shoemaker's shop, that maybe there's something wrong with this whole alcohol business. They aren't really held to the same moral standards as these other business people. So next, he accuses the saloon of being a liar with uh, a common tactic that people in support of alcohol would use was they would say, well, the alcohol business is a huge industry. It provides a lot of tax money. This is how he sort of refused that. So he goes on and says, quote, saloon is a liar. The saloon man says, just look at the taxes I pay. How would the town get along without the money I put in the municipal treasury? Taxes? Taxes. Are you educating your children with the blood of drunkards? Are you paving your streets with the poverty of drinking men, with the broken hearts of widows, with the anguish of destitute orphans? If you are, I hope the stones rise up and smite you. The saloon men and brewers say, look at the labor we employ and the materials we use. But your secretary of labor in Washington says that if the country were made prohibition, there would be greatly better working conditions and increased wages. Yet the booze man tries to make you believe he makes the government go. He's a liar. So again, not only refuting that argument that you may have heard, you know, saying the alcohol industry is huge, it provides a lot of tax money, also trying to shame these people into thinking they have maybe some blood on their hands for taking this tax money for their roads, for their schools, that his audience, even if they don't drink themselves, have some blood on their hands because they're not disrupting this. They are taking advantage of that tax money. Next, he accuses the saloon of being a thief and a robber. He says, quote, the saloon is a thief and a robber. The saloon is the biggest thief and robber out of the penitentiary. It robs you of your manhood. It robs you of your money. It robs you of the love of your children. It robs you of the affection of your wife. It steals the groceries from your cupboard. It even steals the child's milk from the mother's breast. It robs the dead child of its coffin and the starving baby of its crust. It robs the child of its heritage and strength and makes him a bleary-eyed bug and reduces him to the lowest strata of society. And then it laughs over the ruin of a misspent life. Yes, men, the saloon is a robber to the word go. So very scathing accusation he makes here against stealing not just your money, but basically any sort of life you or your children or your grandchildren could potentially have. That's under threat if alcohol is still legal in the United States. So this, I, I would make the case that this is maybe the most scathing accusation he makes out of his whole sermon. All right, finally, or not finally, we got two more. Got two more. <laughs> so next he says that the saloon is an outlaw, referring to how in certain places in society, certain businesses are already trying to distance themselves uh, from the alcohol business. He says, quote, the saloon is an outlaw. The saloon has been outlawed by the Luther Church, the Presbyterian, Reformed, Evangelical, Methodist, and Baptist churches. All have set their ban on. They will not allow saloon keepers to become members if they live up to the rules, nor anyone who has anything to do with the saloon business. The saloon is outlawed by employers. In this day of costly machinery and compensation laws, employers will not take a chance with the drinking man. He is too liable to accidents. The saloon is being outlawed by newspapers. Out of 308 papers in a certain territory, only 21 will accept liquor ads. 
28 leading newspapers in the country will not accept a liquor advertisement in any form. So again, it's not just the religious community trying to distance themselves and get rid of alcohol. You have newspapers, you have uh, factory uh, managers trying to distance themselves and avoid uh, the alcohol business and people engaged with it. Right. His final assertion, he says that the saloon is a murderer. He says this, quote, the saloon murders the virility of our best manhood. Every eight minutes counts the death of a saloon murdered adult in our country. To keep in business, the saloon has to have two million of our boys every year. Every fourth home in Danville must have a mild or confirmed drunkard. Every fifth home in Danville must supply a boy to the saloon each year. Every sixth boy in your town must be saloon fodder, or the saloon goes out of business. That's the stuff that the saloons are after. Are you gonna legalize a thing like that? So again, it harps on that idea of sort of like a military draft, where every fourth home must contribute a son to fight a war. He sort of frames the saloon and the alcohol industry in a similar way, where uh, for the saloon business to keep going, uh, every fifth home in Danville alone must supply someone to sort of have their life cursed by alcoholism. So as he wraps up his sermon, um, I will say, I, I didn't include it here, but in the article, the reporter there said that it was just a standing ovation, overwhelming applause. His sort of tie-up is he asks anyone who supports what he has to say to come up and shake his hand, and everyone tries to rush the podium, and it's like total chaos. Um, but the final remark referring to this whole parade and sermon, they have a warning who says that had the anti boot parade been held tonight, meaning Sunday after, Nicholson's sermon, instead of Saturday night, its numbers would have swelled by the hundreds of men. So, clearly, the people of Danville were eating this stuff up. It's not that this was sort of fringe, that he was outcast for saying all these things. People in Danville, at least publicly, they were going to their private thoughts, but they were totally on board with everything Nicholson had to say. Less than five years later, after the fact, again, this sermon and the parade was in 1915. By 1919, prohibition was the law of the land. It was on So fast forward to 1926, so we're sort of right in the middle of Prohibition. It's been the law of the land for a few years. Um, there was a poll put out nationally, uh, locally and statewide, to get people's uh, ideas about how are they feeling about this whole Prohibition thing, now that they've had a few years with it. And on the right-hand side, you can see some of the results. So it's broken down by Danville. We have some results from Milton. We have some results from Pennsylvania and then sort of a final count. So as far as Danville, about 55% of people who went out of their way to respond agreed that prohibition should stay into effect. So that's about 50-50 split. I'd say that's pretty close. Um, and again, we have to take, take into account not everyone filled out this poll, only people that probably felt strongly enough to bother filling out a poll are being counted here, so that's something to keep in mind. But it's interesting whenever you compare figures to some other places. Uh, Milton had a uh, prohibition approval rate of about 75%. So about 75% of respondents from Milton approved of prohibition even years after it was on the books. Now comparing that to statewide in Pennsylvania and then nationally, uh, in Pennsylvania only 19% of respondents still supported prohibition. Uh, the other 80% either supported outright repeal or modification in some form, maybe allowing certain kinds of alcohol and not others, but only 20% about still support prohibition uh, just about seven years after it's been in effect. And that trend continues nationally, about 19% of people still thought prohibition should be a thing, with 33%, so a third of people feeling that it should be repealed outright, and that's national. So again, this Danville figure doesn't really tell us a whole lot on its own, but compared to some of these other places, we can tell that Danville, and I mean, especially Milton, people were still very strongly feeling that prohibition was something worthwhile, at least publicly. Uh, again, the sources that are available to me, I can't know people's private thoughts. What I was able to see was what was published in the newspapers, which would have bias, and what was in the poll results. So that's what we know so far, at least publicly, public opinion, people lean towards prohibition rather than away from it. So that brings me to the end. Um, again, this is sort of my first taste at trying to uncover some history for Danville. Uh, I've 
Tony, love to teach at the middle school. It's been uh, such a warm welcome. Uh, I'm intrigued by this town's history. Um, and I would like to try to put some more pieces of this progression story together. Um, it seems that people just don't know a whole lot about it right now. And that's great because that leaves a lot of opportunity to fill in some of those gaps. So if you or you know someone who may have information to add to this prohibition story, please feel free to reach out to me. Either come see me after this presentation, uh, email me, text me, whatever. I would love to add to this story and try to uh, flesh this history out. So are there any questions? Yeah. Can I make uh, comments about, I have personal roots with prohibition here in Dan. <laughs> Okay. okay. I thought maybe people who might be interested. My great grandmother and great grandfather owned their railroad house in town. 1923, my grandfather was brought up in charges of possession and distribution of alcohol. He paid a thousand dollar fine. In 1925, he was brought up in charges of possession, and he was jailed for two uh, sentenced for two years in jail. About six months later, his wife petitioned for parole. So the interesting thing there is he was, she was saying how he was such a model prisoner and he has two kids to support and all this other stuff. So then the judge's response to that was, for the first six months, your husband was taken by the sheriff to places to fish, hunt, and outside the county at least a half a dozen times. You brought your husband food daily you know, homemade food and everything else like that. He was not a model prisoner. <laughs> he was preferentially treated and and then they were also involved with the petition was they actually uh, took a, a poll in town. So if you want some statistics there, it said that 200 people said that he should be paroled. Well, 400 people said they should leave him there. <laughs> <laughs> When oh, I was reading it again today, I was like, oh, 200 people, that's great. And I'm like, oh, 400. <laughs> so I don't know what resulted after the, uh, I do know somewhat what happened, but I don't know if he actually got out early or anything, but it sounds like he had to serve a sentence, but between.